Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, may your spirit move in this place and in us. Open our ears, Lord. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Amen. I do not know how or under what circumstances the four of you found each other, but your callous indifference and utter disregard for everything that is good has rocked the very foundation upon which our society is built. Does anybody remember that quote? 21 years ago, those words began a public outcry that I confess to you I did not fully understand then and don't really get to this day. Many people hated the way that Seinfeld ended. That's the judge's sentencing and, and after the sentencing and his, his words to them is that I, I, I don't know how this happened, how you found each other but your callous disregard for everything that is good has rocked the very foundation of, of, the, upon the, of the foundation upon which our society is built. People didn't like the way that Seinfeld ended, but I, for one, thought that it was a brilliant way to end the show that was very openly about nothing. It was a show about nothing. And by having the characters come to their demise, by having them do nothing, I thought was perfect. Whether I like it or not, you've got you to hand it to the writers for sticking to their guns. And, and, and not only that, did they, not only did they, did they get in trouble for doing nothing, but they finished it off, the whole series finished off the character's interaction, the last conversation that they have with each other was the first conversation that George and Jerry had together. You remember the one where they talked about where the second button is, and if the second button's too high, it looks weird, and if it's too low, it looks weird. It's the second button makes the shirt. Showing that in all of the time that had passed, these characters hadn't grown at all, hadn't changed a bit, they had not progressed in the slightest. If you've never watched it, I apologize for, for those who may be left out of the conversation, but what happens in the final episode is that the characters see a man getting robbed, and they watch and they make cracks about this man and his unfortunate situation and they don't help. And so they are arrested for not lending a hand when they see someone in need. Besides the fact that, that the ending of Seinfeld was fitting, I don't understand the uproar of a fan base who wants a different ending. But don't tell that to the Game of Thrones fans. <laughs> All of those who signed a petition that because of their outrage and they were ready and demanding a reshoot of a final episode that, that let's just scrap the $15 million or so that it cost to shoot that in the first place and do it all again, and this time do the way that I want it. Don't tell them that I didn't have a problem with the way Seinfeld ended. For Seinfeld fans, the disappointment might have been more than simply a fierce loyalty and love for these often unlovable characters. It might have been more than that. I, I think that it, also the reason uh, for, for their being locked up, for, helping, for not helping someone who was in need, brushed against the grain of a nation of individuals that bristle at the thought of being held responsible for someone else. Was that the intention of Seinfeld? I don't know. But I thought it was interesting. Jesus definitely challenges an individualistic culture and a mindset in, of individualism in this parable. 
He presses against a, a, a national idea and, and, and racial tensions by making the hero in his parable a person from a place and from a people of ill repute. They were those people, the Samaritans. Often the good Samaritan is, is held up as an example of who we should follow because of something that he did for someone in need. But I'd like to suggest that what made the Samaritan good was not at first what he did, but was how he saw. How he saw, because he saw differently than the priest, and he saw differently than the Levite, who, who saw obstacles and things to be avoided. He saw, and he had pity. Move him to action. That word is an interesting one. Not pity itself, but, but the Greek word that is translated here as pity. If you're a Greek scholar, you're just going to have to bear with me because I am not. Esplanichthi. It only occurs six times. Its root only occurs six times in the New Testament, in the whole Bible, six times, all of which appear in the Gospels. Four of the uses of that word are in reference to a feeling that Jesus has when he encounters need. When he encounters someone who's sick, who's hurting, who's dying, when he encounters a people who are like sheep without a shepherd, he has that same word, that same feeling. And the other two, well, I can give you one that was this today, here today in, in this parable of the Samaritan. And the other occurs in the parable of the prodigal son. When the prodigal returns, the father accepts him because he feels this esplanichthi for his son. It's an interesting thing to look at, and it makes me wonder that, that our New Revised Standard Version, in these six usages, only one time translates it as pity. And that's here in this text. Every other time in the NRSV, it's translated as compassion. He has compassion. Other translations, and maybe a transliteration, would be to have a gut feeling, to have your guts wrenched within you. Now, this isn't just something to stick under our trivia caps and save for a day when somebody who wasn't here this morning, you can impress them with your biblical knowledge. It's not just an exercise in, well, isn't that interesting? I, I think that what this reveals to us is that to look upon need with compassion is Jesus. It is Christian. That's what it looks like to live as one who is living into and out of the kingdom of God. To look upon need with compassion. So how do you, how do I, and how do we look, how do we see need? In my sophomore year of high school, I took a class, something called Religions of the World. I'm not, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but I remember studying, the first thing we talked about was worldviews, and I remember having one of those moments of you mean the whole world doesn't think like I do? What do you mean to tell me that not everybody was raised in those same ways that I was? Maybe a little bit like what Jill was telling us about and, and what the, the people on the video were telling us about when, when you have those moments where you realize not everyone's story is your story. Not everyone sees life and brings the same experience as you do. 
How do you see the world? How do you look at the world? How do you look at people? It was a few years before that that I thought I was destined and desired to become a professional basketball player. I don't know why you're laughing. It's not funny. But being one who was not vertically gifted, I I quickly realized that my place on the court was the point guard. Historically, the least intimidating stature, we'll say it that way, on the court. And because I got a late start in this dream, I I, I needed to work on my dribbling, and so my my coach introduced me to something called dribbling glasses, which are, or or goggles, which are really just these awful looking goggles that go over your eyes, and they cover the bottom portion, about the bottom 40% or so of your vision. And the idea is so that if you can't see down here, you learn to dribble the ball without looking at it, and you know where the ball goes based on what you're doing with your hands. And if you need to figure out where the ball is, you have to look down. And that makes it very obvious to the coach and to everyone else that you don't know what you're doing. And you can't see where your team is. And you are vulnerable. Dribbling glasses. How do you see the world? Do we see the world with dribbling glasses on? Do we see the world with the bottom 40% blocked? Do I see the world with dribbling glasses on? Is this something that we're teaching ourselves, that we are buying into and being reinforced by others to look only up? This morning I thought about the cliche being so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. What starts a look at the world with dribbling glasses on? What starts a look at the world that the priest and the Levite in the parable show us is that sometimes when we encounter need, when we encounter those who are down on their luck, it's easier to pass by on the other side. I think it can be brought back to one word, the sin. Sin that clings so closely to us. Sin that tells me that I am more important than this. It puts blinders on me so that I cannot see as Christ sees. I cannot see with esplanisti. I cannot see and first feel compassion. To be honest with you, I think compassion is an incredibly different, difficult thing to live with on a daily basis. It challenges my selfishness which I don't really like. It shatters my assumptions, which I don't really appreciate. And it puts me in the shoes of Christ, which sometimes feel as if I'm a very small child walking in the shoes of my father. It makes me see more. I believe that's why so many today Christians have a hard time looking with compassion at our southern border. Because the need seems so great. And so we feel that urge, that that pull to put on the dribbling glasses, to pass by on the other side. When Saul encountered Christ on the road, he was blinded by the encounter. And it was only after the scales fell from his eyes that he was able to see with the eyes of Christ, to see what he was doing. 
and how he was doing damage. I do not know how or under what circumstances the four of you found each other, but your callous indifference and utter disregard for everything that is good has rocked the very foundation upon which our society is built. When Christ speaks this parable, what do you feel? Do you feel compassion? Or do you feel callousness? Notice that the lawyer wants to be justified. He wants to know that he is justified by what he has already done. And Jesus, not one to let us sit and rest on our laurels and what we've already done, tells him, go and do. To not be allowed to rest in what we have done, but to go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.